My name is Mark Demopoulos. I'm executive director of the National Hellenic Society. We're a proud association of Greek Americans and Philippines who celebrate and perpetuate Hellenic heritage, our culture, our values uh, through outstanding programs. I want to kick off the discussion with two really brief quotes from my, my favorite philosopher, Pictetus, who said, difficulties are things that show a person what they are. And the other one, it's not what happens to you, but how you react to it that matters. And the difficulties we face today, how we react at home as a nation, as a community, as a world, who show posterity our anthropotita, who we were, especially as Greek Americans who uh, our forebears endured so much for so long, overcame to see their progeny thrive. Look at, look at our panel today. I want to thank all the panelists and our friends and uh, thank uh, our moderator, John Metaxas, uh, a proud Columbia University journalist, fellow lawyer, CBS and Bloomberg Radio are very fortunate to have you, John. CNN, uh, sorry to lose you as the host of Your Money. With that, I'll kick it, kick it over to John. Thank you all, too, for joining in this, uh, this wonderful discussion of these outstanding panelists. All right. Well, thank you very much, Art. And uh, it's my pleasure to be here. Hello from Katona, New York, where we're sheltering in place like everybody else. And uh, we had uh, a very good reaction to last week's panel. And this week we have a really stellar panel uh, for everybody on the economic road ahead. And this on a day when the NASDAQ, I might add, uh, recouped all of its losses for the year today. So uh, uh, that leads me to wonder um, what's going on. And I think our, our uh, not just in the markets, but in the economy and in the broader picture as well. We'll get a macro view and we'll get some, uh, we'll dig in a little deeper as well today. We uh, do have a great group. Uh, we're going to start with uh, John Kudunis. John is the CEO of Calamos Investments, a global investment firm servicing the needs of institutional and private investors since 1977. And he oversees a team of more than 300 professionals. They manage several mutual funds, closed end, private and exchange traded funds. And their clientele at Calamos includes Fortune 100 corporations, pension funds, endowments, foundations, and individual accounts. John has 30 years plus in his career, and he was the president and CEO of Mizuho Securities, a subsidiary of one of the world's largest full-service financial institutions. John, it's always great to see you, and uh, you're batting first. Thank you, John, and uh, everybody. Christos Anesti, I appreciate uh, the opportunity to be on this call. Um, unfortunately, I can't stay that long because I've uh, overcommitted to a whole bunch of things, but I'd love to give my two cents in, 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 uh, in the talks here and, uh, and uh, hopefully be uh, somewhat additive. Um, if you have any particular questions or if you want me to talk about my outlook or what, I, what I'm thinking, what I'm seeing from the seat I'm in, uh, you tell me, John, how do you want me, how do, how do you want me to draw this? Well, uh, tell us from your perspective, uh, what, is the, the, uh, what is the economic road ahead? First of all, where are we? You have a very unique perspective, uh, given that you have uh, run a financial institution and, 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 and you're doing that right now as well. Uh, you've, you've dealt with the Far East as well as the financial markets here in the United States. Where are we right now in terms of uh, in, in terms of the economy? To me, it looks like there's a disconnect right now. You have uh, the stock market booming, but the bond market is telling us that with, with interest rates going way down, that the economy is not so good. So, what is the reality? And and really, you have free reign because you know far more about what's sure. going on than any of us. Well, I think. Uh I think let me start by saying we have two issues here. One is the markets, right? And they don't necessarily uh, are the same thing as what the economy is doing. And what has happened in the past and what we're seeing right now is the markets are leading and a lot more optimistic than what the actual economy and the state of the economy is. And you'll see that typically, we saw that in all the different times when we had stress in the financial markets. So, Right now, I think the market is fairly optimistic, and that's why we're seeing the NASDAQ back at the place where we saw it pre uh, the start of the COVID uh, issues. And I think that we're gonna have um, a choppy, and the volatility is gonna continue for some time now. And we're gonna see a lot of it have to do with 
a lot of it is event-driven risk. And what we're hearing both on the COVID situation and as we see earnings in the economy and the, and the numbers come out as we've seen in unemployment and whatnot and start to resonate with the people and how quickly we can recover. Now, I don't think we're gonna have any real conviction till we have a particular time in the future where we know that we can go forward. And that time is probably when we have a vaccine that's proven to be correct. And, and, uh, uh, and from my calls to the White House and whatnot, I think that's gonna be Q1 of next year. So till then, I think that the markets will be extremely volatile, uh, yet optimistic. So, and you're right, the bond markets are, are saying that we're not healthy, which is true. And the equity markets are being optimistic. A lot of it has to do with the, you know, with what's happened both with the Fed and monetary policy providing a lot of liquidity, which has helped. And of course, uh, it's also what's happened fiscally and what uh, they've been able to do in terms of these packages to help uh, at least put a band-aid temporarily. Uh, and that's what's helped this, this market, uh, you know, go forward and be a little bit more optimistic. In terms of the economy, I think it's, there's going to be some damage that is going to be uh, uh, here with us for a while. But as a human culture and race, we, are, we, we tend to overcome a lot of this stuff. So the question that everybody's debating and all the, all the experts and these economists, are we going to have a V-shaped? Are we going to have a U-shaped? Are we going to have a Nike? Uh, you know, check type of, uh, of rebound, or is it going to be a W? And that's very difficult to predict. Um, during this crisis, it was a little bit easier at the beginning, but as they extended the stay at home and whatnot, it changes everything and the damage becomes a lot larger for the economy. And some of it will not uh, recover until we see some kind of conviction that we can go back to full stadiums, that we can go back to restaurants, that we can go back to the theater and everything. And that's going to be a little bit further down the road. So I think we will see a recovery. I think it's going to be a lot more, if at our best, once we do get the vaccine, it'll be, I think, more of a U or perhaps a, like a check or a Nike swoosh. But till then, I'm afraid that we're going to see uh, more of a W, ups and downs, and the volatility is going to continue. So I think for people, it's really important to navigate and talk to professionals like Mike Bappas and others who have uh, expertise and, and risk manage their way through this. And what's your view of, uh, of the uh, you know, strength of the financial institutions vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the crisis 10 years ago? ago? Well, 10 years ago was, was different. And, and um, I mean, that was definitely the bank's balance sheets were, 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 were not in good shape. And uh, now I think that uh, this is a whole different situation, but depending on how long it is and how long this takes, it could do some irreparable damage. Having said that, I'm pretty optimistic that we will come through and come back um, as long as in the next month or so that we can get back on our feet, slowly opening the economy. Now, what is, uh, you know, something that can't be determined at least uh, is, will we have a relapse of the virus? Will we have to close the economy again? And that's something that nobody can predict. Uh, I would assume that we'll have a little bit of a relapse with uh, the social distancing becoming less of a, an importance, but to the extent of how bad it's gonna be, uh, it's very difficult to predict. And that's going to be the underlying factors of what happens uh, going forward. And uh, with your experience uh, leading a Japanese uh, institution in your uh, previous position, uh, how do you see the interplay between the U.S. and China here? Uh, what about the, the war of words we've been seeing at, at the top? And, uh, and what do you make of how China handled this? Well, uh, John, you know, I don't want to get political, but there is a lot of finger pointing on both ends. Um, and I like to, um, so uh, the thing is, there's definitely, it's not in a good sh spot right now. And there's a lot of people uh, trying to figure out what is the best way to handle this. And I think that uh, right now, I think we want to get back on our feet. And if I had any uh, 
words of wisdom. There is definitely uh, a way to handle this. There's definitely ways to deal with China. Uh, but right now, I think we need to deal with getting our people healthy, saving lives, uh, trying to get back the economy, and then uh, the negotiations. I know that there's a trade, uh, another trade talk next week that uh, is, is scheduled, and hopefully that that, that could be somewhat of, of a cordial uh, meeting because I think that um, we need to get back on our feet as a world, uh, let alone the United States, before we handle some of issues that were here before the virus, and they've just been exasperated, and there's a lot of finger pointing going on, um, and you know, who's right or who's wrong? I have my own opinions, but it's, you know, that's just an opinion, uh, but I, I, I'm hoping that it doesn't get blown out of proportion, at least right now, and there's ways I think politically we can deal with it economically through different sanctions and whatnot, but not paying back debt or, or whatnot is not necessarily the way to do it, but maybe tariffs and other things are. But once again, we need to find out the truth and then deal with it at that point. But I think all hands on deck should be saving lives and bringing back this economy. All right, uh, John, thank you very much. I know you do have to leave us. Uh, can I throw one more question at you? Sure, absolutely. All right, so uh, you've spoken about the uh, repatriation of, of industry. Do you see big changes in terms of supply chains being shortened and, and brought back into the States? How, how, how is industry going to change? Well, um, I'm fortunate where I've been speaking to a lot of CEOs in a lot of the pharmaceutical companies as of late and some of the other manufacturing companies. And the administration has, did, has put a big push from day one to repatriate jobs to the United States. I think that's just going to get accelerated uh, after we see that uh, the, in, the dependence of outside sources. Now, that doesn't do a lot for globalism, but it, it really would help our country uh, if we are not reliable, especially for the essentials going forward. And I think that uh, the script and the playing field will definitely be um, uh, biased towards bringing more jobs and more industry back to the United States in order for us to be efficient when, uh, if unfortunately something like this would happen again, we would be a lot more prepared and uh, not rely on other countries to, to, to help us uh, in this situation. So I think that's going to be magnified and definitely uh, continue at a more rapid pace than we actually saw beforehand. All right. Thank you very much, John. We really appreciate uh, your spending time with us today. Well, thank you very much. And uh, if, if you want to stay on, you can. If you need to rush I out. I have a couple that... more minutes. I'd love to hear some of the others, this, this oh. distinguished guests here. And we did break with the format a little bit uh, with John. We, we did the Q&A. Uh, there is a chat function and a Q&A function. So all, everybody listening can submit their questions. We'll get to them in the second half of the uh, program. Uh, everybody else, if you want, we can do Q&A at the top or you can do a, a, your five minute statement on your own. But uh, Mike uh, Bappas, I know you have to, uh, your schedule is a little tight today too. So we'll go to you next. Mike is Managing Director of Private Wealth Services at Vios Advisors at Rockefeller Capital Management. His clientele includes private and institution portfolios. He specializes in providing his services to professional athletes, entertainers, and large institutions. He began his career at Morgan Stanley and Hightower Advisors. Mike is a registered advisor with the NFL's Players Association, providing long-term financial planning for professional athletes. And that could probably be a topic in itself, but uh, Mike, uh, the floor is yours. Good to have you with us. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Thanks for having me to uh, Christos Anesti. Uh, I think it's a great idea what the NHS is doing and, and I'm happy to participate here. Um, I'll speak a little bit about the markets in the beginning and then we'll move to like allocations and, and how we are managing our assets. But I think one of the biggest issues you have you're balancing fundamentals, which are pretty much out the window and reset. You could always go back into markets to, to fundamentals and see, okay, is this overvalued? Is this undervalued? What does the cash flow look like? And I think that's why you're seeing such volatility in the markets is because nobody knows what fundamentals mean anymore. Uh, they're reset for probably six to nine months. Companies are using this uh, to tighten up their business models, but also trying to survive. I think that's one of the biggest elements. Uh, you also have a lot of companies sitting on a lot of cash looking for investments, 
but not sure where to go. And probably the third most important component to this is the reference to the fixed income markets versus the equity markets. You had, uh, let's say in 08, you probably had nine months of a downturn and a uh, real scare in the fixed income markets. This happened in one weekend or five days where the whole market just seized up. You saw mass liquidations on you know, high grade corporates and the high yield market was trading an evaluation over the treasury higher than it was at any point in 08 and 09. You also saw high grade corporate bonds, high grade uh, companies, which were trading at down 10%, which is, I mean, extremely rare. So the element of the fixed income struggle and where that's gonna shake out, not even the high yield fixed income for, for, or, the, or the CMBS or any of the other markets, um, but you also have some optimism in the equity markets that once this uh, ends, there's so much stimulus in the economy that the fundamentals will revert back to the other side and almost to where they were uh, uh, pre-COVID. But you, you know, you also, the element that I think is, is probably the most difficult for all of us is balancing the emotional element of this with uh, you know, human life, with we all know people who have, have had issues with this and balancing the element of human life and survival with, okay, markets and, and, and where, where does this economy go? You're also, I think, I think it's a perfect storm in, in, in not, not to use a cliche, but it is a perfect storm. And you're also in an election year where emotions are running high across that component of the business too. And I think, I think you're, you're, you're seeing so many people so confused and trying to figure it out. And you, the public markets, the public equity markets are at least giving some comfort because you can see what's going on day to day. So, um, you know, as far as John, if I'll just go to advising clients and what we do there, we're, we're, we're trying to, to focus people on, you know, long-term portfolios. Uh, if your risk is adjusted, let's, let's talk about that right now. But we, you know, we try to keep a, a, a balanced portfolio where we're here to preserve the wealth and get some growth. So we have equity exposure, we have fixed income exposure, and then we have um, alternative ex exposure, which has really helped us during this time because it limits the volatility. And, and uh, John Kadunas was on just, just now, uh, they have a market neutral portfolio that, that, you know, those types of vehicles keep the volatility down and keep your, your assets growing while limiting uh, a lot of the downside during this time in the markets. I, I, what, other, what other points did you think are relevant, uh, John, that, that, that I can cover uh, for, for, for the audience? Well, I mean, I, I think, I mean, I, I think uh, many uh, people are really concerned about uh, what is happening to their uh, portfolios. Uh, I want to also get into uh, later on uh, with Phil about how people of lesser means are being impacted by this. But uh, for, for those who are, who are uh, part of the white collar economy, for those who do have investments, uh, I think it was very interesting to hear you talk about the emotional aspect of it. At a certain point on March 23rd there, you, you saw a good portion of your retirement going away. And uh, and then and and then you're dealing at the same time with all uh, a lot of the misery that's around everywhere. How have you dealt with that with your clients? Yeah, that's a great question. And and the other the other element to the emotionality of it during that time was the, it was totally unknown. It was totally unknown. You know, where 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 is this going to go? Is it how bad is the epidemic? And again, reverting back to the emotionality of it and, and, and the, the fundamental side of it, what, what we tried to do in those times is just um, make sure that we, we use active management. We believe active management outperforms passive management, especially in these times. Uh, you'll see, you'll see um, the active managers are, are in a place now that have limited the downside versus the indices. But what we try to do is just, it, it almost becomes a psychological thing making sure all of our, our investments are doing the right things. There's no style drift, making sure we're speaking to the portfolio managers. On the other side, reaching out to clients, ensuring clients 
are uh, comfortable with the risk. They, they want a, a voice to talk to, an expert to talk to. And it's almost like, you know, the bedside manner of a doctor. When you, when you go to the doctor, you want someone to, to give you comfort in, in, in what we are all going through. Uh, the, the, the more difficult part I think today is, is how advanced technology is and how much access people have to information like right now uh, from the TV to all the social media to all the interaction we have now sitting from our homes or, or home offices or, or where we may be. Um, you're, you're in constant dialogue. You're constantly seeing something. You're constantly talking to someone. And so to, to try to white out all of that noise becomes difficult for everybody. And, and we, we, we position ourselves to be the voice of reason in those times and, and, and remind people that, uh, you know, their, their, the risk tolerance that you've outlined, your portfolio is, is structured in a way that it can weather storms like this and, and try to continue as hard as it is the long-term uh, investment, which probably got extended by six to nine months, given what's going on. But the long-term investment, uh, as long as the qu quality of the companies are there and the quality of the managers are there, uh, is is will get the growth and the preservation that that clients are looking for. All right, uh, I do want to move on to the other panelists, but the questions are coming in, so I'm going to throw one last one at you before we do move on, Mike, because uh, I know your your schedule is tight. Ambassador Theros asks. Is the stock market a valid indicator of the realities of our economy? Should we judge the economy by other knowable indicators? Yeah, look, uh, very, everybody's asking that question and it's very relevant in today's world. Uh, historically, the stock market has preceded the economy by six to 12 months. Uh, and, and I think you're seeing an optimistic, but yet volatile side of the, of the, of the markets saying that Assuming we get past this in six to nine to 12 months, uh, there is the, sti the, the fiscal stimulation that, that will work in, in, in a positive way. And you have uh, hopefully the business owners, hopefully the, the um, companies who are sitting on piles of cash can deploy that in a way that will, that will continue the growth of the economy. You probably have seen the markets get a little ahead of themselves right now. Uh, you've seen there, there's, there's some short interest pressure that, that once they run up like that, uh, it, it, it magnifies it. Uh, algorithms are at the front of the markets and, and that anytime you have that, the volatility goes all over the place. But, you know, again, it's, it's hard to say relative to the economy because we haven't seen what the numbers look like in third and fourth quarter. And what are companies making? What are the fundamentals of this? You see some of these technology companies are, are, are even doing better than they were before. Uh, on the flip side, you have, you know, cruise lines, restaurants, uh, a lot of the, a lot of the um, consumer-driven companies that are that are airlines that are really really struggling. So I think it's just a balancing act right now, and that's why you're seeing some optimism in the, in the in the equity markets, and you're also seeing some fear in the fixed income markets. So it's it's pretty it's pretty it's pretty crazy how all over the place it is right now. I do believe that there is a, 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 a optimistic sentiment out there that Americans and, and our country will rally around this. We as a human race uh, at some point have quite a resilience and, and there's gonna be an unforeseen element that moves this in a positive direction that none of us can, can see right now that I think will, will help vault us into a better place as, a, as an economy and as a, as a market. I promised I'd let you go, but now I'm getting one more question and no you can handle it quickly. Uh, John Karamanos asks, when do you think inflation will start kicking in? And then I'll add, well, do you think maybe deflation will start kicking in? And he wants to know, would you recommend gold or bonds? What strategy? Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, I think that we could, right now, the best thing we can hope for is inflation. Uh, that's probably not going to be the case in three to five years when it does come and it does it does uh, put a strain on our economy, but you'd rather see that right now than, than, than uh, negative rates, than deflation, because that, that would create a massive divide in our economy. Um, so I think, I don't think you'll see infl inflation for a while. When it does come, I would be concerned about it, but your bigger risk is, is negative 
economic news negative negativity towards the economy and, and deflation. Um, but as far as, as, as gold, and we, we do uh, recommend an allocation to alternative investments, whether that's multi-strat funds, whether that's uh, commodity funds, whether it's uh, market neutral funds, whether it's global macro funds, because a lot of those are uncorrelated to the markets and they're uncorrelated relative to the, to the businesses. Uh, as long as the credit markets stay, I, I'm a little concerned about the credit markets just because they, they have been so volatile and people are moving out of high grade, triple A rated cash like components into treasuries. And that's why you're seeing the treasury yields are so low because that's people are so fearful that that's all they're moving into. Once that loosens up, I think the credit markets will move back to where they, they should trade in a normalized range. And that will that will help the economic and the and the risk of inflation in the short term. Uh, excuse me, risk of inflation in the long term, and risk of deflation and negative economy in the short term. All right, uh, thank you, Mike. Uh, we really appreciate your words Thanks, of sir. wisdom. And uh, I appreciate it. Sorry, I had to run, but I appreciate being on this, and, and I and I give credit to the whole the whole organization at National Hunting Society, Drake and Art, and everybody involved. So, thanks thanks for all you do. Thank you and uh, stay safe. All Thank right, uh, let's, um, well, let's move on to uh, uh, Doretta, who uh, if, if we could have somebody who is a specialist in any industry to tell us about the economic impact of the times we're in, I think it, it would be uh, Doretta uh, because she is a specialist in health investment banking where she's a managing director at Citigroup based in New York and she's responsible for the firm's coverage of the healthcare technology and outsourcing practice. Before that, she was at Citigroup. Well, I'm sorry, before joining Citigroup, she spent 15 years at Goldman Sachs in their healthcare group focused on M&A. And while there, she worked on $200 billion transactions plus in the healthcare industry. And she serves on the board of the National Hellenic Society and the Panhellenic Scholarship Foundation. Doretta, uh, welcome. And um, this is uh, certainly having an impact on, on, that, on all facets of the healthcare industry from the hospitals that are on the front line to the pharmaceutical companies that are on the front line of developing uh, cures and the vaccines and treatments. Um, tell us uh, where you think, see things going. Yes, sure. So first of all, thank you for, for having me. It's, it's a pleasure um, to be here. And I thought I would offer perspectives on uh, two areas because they are interrelated. One, generally just the Wall Street perspective on um, the economy and the market and how that's impacted the, by the COVID uh, pandemic. And then specifically in healthcare, um, the current environment has put a spotlight on the healthcare gaps and what are the longer term implications and anticipated reactions to, to address um, those gaps. And I think one of the key situations where we find ourselves today versus maybe the financial crisis uh, in 08 um, is the fact that we talked about that not only are the banks in a better position, but the Fed was also very quick to step in. And what that meant was that even though capital for companies has become more restricted, companies have had access to the capital markets in order to bolster their, their balance sheet and provide the liquidity that will be necessary to weather um, whatever it is, the, the weeks, the months of uh, the, the pandemic. And just to put a, it a little bit in perspective, um, just on the investment grade debt side, year to date, we have seen a total of $800 billion of debt raised. And that's 90% ahead of what we saw last year. And by the end of this week, if it continues at the pace we expect it to be, the volume will have exceeded all of the volume that, would, that was issued last year in investment grade. And then even on the equity side, year-to-date volumes are ahead of 2019 levels, even though the mix of that has shifted to be less IPOs and more towards convertibles and follow-ons um, to bolster liquidity. And all that has been encouraging uh, to see that even some of the more vulnerable companies such as airlines and cruise lines and restaurants have been able to access the markets from a capital perspective. And in healthcare, that translates to some of the more impacted areas, um, such as the hospitals and some of those kind of post-acute elective procedure type um, companies 
where they've seen the most the most impact um, because of the of the pandemic. Um, from a healthcare specific impact, healthcare has historically been viewed as a more defensive industry and thus more insulated than maybe some of the more cyclical industries in periods of recessions. However, I would say the one key difference in this situation that we're in today is that it's a healthcare crisis as well. And as a result, there have been material ramifications, both positive and negative, to the healthcare industry. Um, that being said, healthcare as a whole has been probably the best performing subsector um, of the S&P, only down about 3% since the market peak in February versus maybe some of the other subsectors such as energy and industrials that have been down closer on average to 30%. And so I thought I'd talk a little bit about the structural shifts that we're seeing occurring and then ultimately conclude with where do we see this going from here? So one of the biggest takeaways is that technology and innovation is incredibly important. And I think the area where we've probably seen the biggest impact of this has been in telehealth. Um, even though it was considered to be a growing area in healthcare, even before the pandemic hit, utilization was in, still very low. And so in fact, Teladoc, which is probably considered the largest and most well-known provider of telehealth services, cited utilization levels in and around 7%. Uh, the current environment that we're in has enabled significant changes in three areas, um, which has really provided a tipping point in the acceptability and adoption of telehealth. One is just consumer awareness. Um, secondly, and I think most importantly, is that physicians and hospitals are embracing virtual care as a way to deliver, deliver care. Uh, I think previously, um, physicians or hospital system used, viewed it as a little impersonal and more troublesome than beneficial. But with the need to use it now, they've found that satisfaction is high, it's easy to use, and they're much more comfortable using the technology. And then lastly, insurance companies and employers are viewing it much more broadly, and it's certainly been helped by the government deciding to reimburse telehealth visits. Um, technology has not only impacted the delivery of care, but it also has implications for clinical trials as well. Um, unfortunately, there's been a number of very important clinical trials that have been put on hold because of the pandemic. Um, you have people that are unable to go to hospitals to, to get tested, and also companies not willing to risk the, tri the, the outcome of their trial in case patients get COVID. And they've introduced now remote patient monitoring where, wherever possible in order to protect the patient and help keep trials up and running. And to the extent this continues to be successful, it may actually change on a go-forward basis the way clinical trials are conducted. Um, a couple more areas where we've seen change. One is just the appreciation of R&D and innovation. There's been a lot of focus over the years around pharma and drug pricing. And what the pandemic has shown is that innovation matters, whether that's on the R and drug development side or the clinical testing side, companies need to continue to do R and D. And the pricing will continue to be a focus, particularly I think for older, more generic drugs. Um, I think there is a recognition that pharmaceutical companies will, con will continue to play a key role in the solution of problems. And then finally, I know there was a discussion around repatriation. Um, healthcare, like so many other industries, had shifted certain productions, I'd say primarily in the pharmaceutical ingredient and, and manufacturing side, to lower cost area, areas such as China and India. And I think the current crisis has highlighted that companies need to diversify their exposure, both to suppliers and to manufacturers, but also mostly also to countries. And so I think you will see, and we've actually been in dialogue with, with companies looking to shift and raise capital to, to lift manufacturing away from areas such as China and India into more established areas like, like US and, and Europe. All right, thank you very much for those remarks. Uh, we are uh, getting some questions in, so if you don't mind, maybe I'll throw uh, 
one at you right now from uh, John Karamanos. Uh, and, and you touched on this, I think, but uh, his question is, what is the forecast for commercial construction and mission critical structures such as data centers, life sciences, healthcare, and commercial buildings uh, among the companies that you follow? And do you see uh, corporate buyouts of weaker cash-strapped companies and perhaps mergers and acquisitions? Yeah, well, um, great questions. I would say on the construction side, uh, I, I say it depends. I think the reality is, is that companies are so strapped for cash right now and just managing through the pandemic that the, re the reality is, is that CapEx budgets and the ability to invest and build um, is going to be muted for the foreseeable future. Now, that's not to say that uh, stockpiling for whether it's respirators or masks, I think this, this whole um, pandemic has illuminated that um, stockpiling and just-in-time inventory management had come to be very lean. And so I, I think you, you've already seen some government contracts with respect to masks and, and items like that to increase the stockpile. But when it comes to actual CapEx investments in areas like that, I do think it will be muted for the foreseeable future until we see um, things start to rebound. On the M&A side, I would say that th that has probably been the area that has been most impacted in the area um, of, of COVID, a couple of reasons. One, financing is tougher to come by and companies would rather use their capital to bolster their balance sheet than acquire businesses. Second, companies are more um, focused on internally managing their business, and it's really tough to figure out what you're going to pay for a company given the uncertainty. And then finally, logistically, it's really hard to negotiate, conduct diligence, and then ultimately integrate businesses given the social distancing measures. That being said, what we've found in previous um, recessions is for the time after the recession, m and we typically see an m and surge to even pre past pre-shock levels post the recession. I would say the area that we see it first come back is large corporates that have the balance sheet and the wherewithal to um, conduct m and And then we typically see the, the leverage buyouts. But I would say until you start to see a rebound in the fixed income markets and the high yield markets, I think we're, we're still several quarters away of seeing kind of the, the same level of buyouts that, that we saw pre-crisis. And one other question for you that uh, has just come in. Do you see the uh, huge amounts of startups, emerging companies that are looking to find solutions, especially uh, in the biotech sector? Do you see them having renewed interest from investors? Uh, it's it's actually been interesting on the biotech side. I think if you if you go back to the crisis in two thousand and eight, um, there were a period of a couple of years where there was not a single biotech IPO. Um, now in this environment, even though we're seeing a lot more volatility, you are seeing uh, biotech IPOs still happen. Now the dynamics associated with those IPOs is very different. Um, they often go public with a lot of insider support already uh, there so that they're not really relying on the public markets to entirely support and build the book. But um, we've actually seen four or five biotech IPOs launch price and do very well in this, in this pandemic. And so I, even though funding will be harder to come by um, in this environment, you are seeing um, funding still occur. I, I think ultimately it will be a question of how long um, and how quick is the recovery and the, and the pandemic. But I think the factors that R&D is important, companies need to, need to innovate, will continue to fund the, the biotech boom, and ultimately what you might see, and we saw this in, in the, after the 08 crisis as well, is you might see an increase in an m a of companies that once where the IPO market was more accessible, now might choose to, to sell themselves instead. 
All right. Thank you, Doretta. We have more questions, but I think we'll try to hear from the other panelists and then perhaps circle back at the end. And if we don't get to everybody's question, uh, we can forward the ones that were not asked during the program to the participant and, and try to get you an answer for that. But uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Doretta. Let's move to uh, Nick uh, Secularidis, uh, who has spent 35 years as an investment banker, most recently as Managing Director of M&A at Citigroup. He covered the automotive, home building, and building products sectors. And prior to Cine, he was at uh, Smith Barney, where he was co-head of M&A and restructuring. And he's also uh, very well known as the uh, co-chair and principal owner of the Dayton Dragons, a minor league baseball team and affiliate of the Cincinnati Reds and uh, one of the most successful minor league baseball teams in the United States. Nick also had a front row seat for the, uh, nine, uh, for the uh, financial crisis of 10 years ago. And I think uh, we'll, we'll get a very good perspective between Nick and uh, Phil on that crisis, both looking at the uh, perhaps uh, uh, from, uh, from the inside and then from the, from the government point of view. Uh, Nick, uh, take it away. Yeah, thank you very much, John. Thanks to the organizers of this uh, conference and Christos uh, Anesti to everyone. I wanted to touch on three topics and uh, through that we'll talk a little about the comparisons between the 08 crisis and the current crisis. And it's to kind of take it up to a macroeconomic level of number one, how big is this economic problem? Number two, what is the fiscal capacity of the United States to deal with the problem? And number three, what is the political will and capacity to deal with the problem? So first, as to the size of the problem, uh, the, you cannot underestimate the business destruction, the value chain destruction, trade destruction, literal starvation in the third world, and massive unemployment. These are terrible, terrible things. The crisis differs from 2008 in the sense that what we have here is a self-induced economic coma to mitigate a catastrophic health crisis. As compared to 2008, we had financial ruin that led to unemployment and recession. Here we have unemployment and recession, self-induced, leading to potential financial ruin. And the thing that stands between us and financial ruin is the last man standing, the federal government. And that is going to be the difference between recession and depression. How big is the problem? A lot of estimates suggest that at least in the short term, in terms of this massive unemployment and shutdown that we have right now, we could lose 20% of demand, 20% of GDP. On a 20 trillion GDP, that's a $4 trillion problem. And that's what needs to be addressed in the short term, number one. So what, question number two, what's the capacity of the government to deal with this? And fortunately for this country, and in comparison to virtually all other countries in the world, we have overwhelming capacity to plug that gap, overwhelming capacity. To borrow $4 trillion and get funds into the hands of individuals, companies, states, municipalities, and keep them going, to borrow that, we have to pay less than 1% interest, 0.073% to borrow money for 10 years. This is the virtually the all-time low borrowing rate for the United States government. And the irony of all of this is that the very crisis has caused the financing costs of the United States to plummet. And that's because, as has been mentioned earlier, there's a massive flight to quality throughout the world, and everyone from individuals in the United States to the very tin pot dictators throughout the world who have claimed that the days of America are over, are putting their money into the only safe asset in the world, which is US treasuries. And therefore the government's able to borrow trillions of dollars, not pay it back for 10 years and pay 0.73% interest. So that means for the next few months, next year, this year, 
0.73% times 4 trillion borrowing is $300 billion. And that represents less than 6% of the budget of the United States. And frankly, it's even better than that because the trillion dollars that was borrowed to fill the deficit in the last crisis, the year 2010, this year, we've been paying more than 3% for that. So the bottom line is we're gonna refinance that in today's low interest rate environment and save $300 billion. So essentially the net cash short-term cost of plugging a $4 trillion, 20% GDP gap in the economy and keeping the economy on life support so that it does not go into depression, the cost from a cash basis is zero. Now I understand there are long-term issues. Somebody's got to pay the $4 trillion back in the future, but this falls into the general number one economic principle of much better to be dead probably tomorrow than to be dead for sure today. So it is a no brainer to borrow this money, plug the gap, avert a depression. Huge problem, huge capacity of the United States to deal with it. Number three, the fact that you have the capacity does not mean you have a solution. There needs to be political will to implement and wisdom to implement those unique resources and create the solution. On the political will side, from MSNBC, CNN, that we are in a drastic, near apocalyptic partisan environment. On the one side, the president is somewhere between a traitor, a Russian spy, and indifferent to human suffering. And on the other side, the Democrats are socialists, communists, and are engineering a shutdown just to defeat the president. The rhetoric is god awful. It is completely partisan. But the action is shockingly partisan. And the willpower has been extraordinary. So you might have missed that uh, in two weeks, the Senate voted 96 to nothing in two weeks to spend $2 trillion to help the economy. So there was, three, there was 300 billion in direct transfers, the $1,200 a person, 260 billion in unemployment insurance extension. 340 billion to the states for their expenses, 500 billion in loans to large firms, 377 billion in forgivable loans to small firms, and that's been increased another 300 billion. So we're rapidly closing in on financing, probably past the three trillion level, and you've got the House wanting to spend more money for the states, the president wanting to spend two trillion on infrastructure, so we are getting to plugging that $4 trillion gap amidst incredible vituperative rhetoric, but shockingly rapid bipartisan conduct. And as compared to 2008, the actions are larger and faster. It's $4 trillion of stimulus rather than one to two. In two to four weeks, we've done what took a year to happen in 2008. People will remember the long road from the fall of Bear Stearns in the spring of 08, the rescue of AIG in the fall, TARP in December uh, to rescue the banks and the auto companies and then the stimulus package in the first quarter of you know, 2009. That was a year path. So why did this willpower exist today, or does it exist today, and the action steps have been able to be implemented so rapidly and at such large scale. And I would say three, four reasons. Number one, it's not just about an economy dying, it's about people dying, including the legislators who are making the laws, and so death concentrates the mind. I don't think that can be minimized in terms of the willpower. Number two, the very fact of the 2008 crisis provided an off-the-shelf playbook for what to do. 
So as an example, legal documents and term sheets were there allowing the new lending programs in six days, rather than the six months it took them in 2008 to craft these from scratch. That's kind of at the technical level. At the big level, the fact that the playbook existed proved out that depression could be averted by virtue of huge government intervention. So number three, the other factor that has enabled this to happen so rapidly is the fact that last time, the biggest obstacle to the, when, that, when TARP, for instance, was voted down in the Congress initially, and the whole economy almost melted down at that point, one of the big blocks was that there was huge fear if the government spent this much money, there would be massive inflation. So guess what? It's been 10 years, no inflation. So minds are concentrated because it's death. Minds are more comfortable because there was a playbook and we have proof that large government spending can avert a depression. Willpower is more concentrated because no inflation was triggered last time around. It's not to say it won't happen this time, but people are guided by what happened last time. And I think number four, there's an incredibly ironic piece, which is that the opposition to TARP and the using the government to spend this much money, concerns about bailouts, uh, concerns about the government getting too much influence over individual life, that reaction triggered the development of the Tea Party, further accelerated by the government's jumping in to do Obamacare and so forth. So here's the incredible irony. Who is the president of the United States? He is the titular leader of the Tea Party, the titular leader of the opposition to huge government intervention. But ironically, this president of the United States in his fire, prior life, 50 years in the private sector, thought of himself as the king of debt. So he has no visceral constraint or reaction to spending trillions of dollars, particularly when it means that the whole fate of the country is, is um, uh, at stake. So it's an incredible irony that all these factors together meant no organized opposition to big government spending. The big government spending is being led by the head of the Tea Party, and the government has faced a huge problem, has had the capacity to deal with it, and has had the political will to deal with it, at least to avert a depression. Now, I don't want to underestimate the situation. There are huge problems. There's going to be volatility. We can snatch it's not even victory yet, but the chance of victory, uh, we can snatch defeat from the jaws of potential victory here. But we should also not underestimate the enormous resources the government has because of this very special country to deal with these problems. All right. Thank you, Dink. Uh, uh, very uh, optimistic uh, point of view in terms of uh, both the uh, government's uh, ability to handle this and in, in terms of your uh, view of the fact that uh, perhaps things are uh, more bipartisan than we think they are at this point. Thank you for, for those comments. And uh, to Phil Angelides ahead of time, Phil, uh, my apologies for having you last, but uh, perhaps we saved the best for last. I'm sure we did. Uh, Phil is no stranger to the economic meltdown. He served as chair of the 10-member Bipartisan Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission established by Congress in 2009. He was charged with investigating the events that led to the collapse of the financial markets the year before. Phil served as California's state treasurer and as trustee for California's multi-billion dollar pension funds, creating more than 100,000 units of affordable housing, schools, parks, and infrastructure. He was the Democratic nominee for governor in 2006 and is currently president of Riverview Capital Investments, which focuses on sustainable urban development and clean energy projects. He has uh, many different perspectives on the issue today. Phil, the floor is yours. Thank you, John. Thank you very much. And thank you to the National Hanuk Society for putting this together, to Drake and to Art and the whole team. I'm going to be, I'm looking at the clock here. It's 1.55. This has been a great discussion. 
I'm actually, uh, it will, the uh, last will be best because it perhaps will be the shortest. Well, you can go longer, Phil. You can take your 10 That's minutes. A, I, know I need to go. Folks need to go. But I want to start by saying, uh, I, Nick actually put on the table a lot of the things I would say about the magnitude of the problem, which warrants a response of a magnitude great enough to wrestle the problem to the ground. And I will start by saying that I do think there's a human inclination when a crisis comes along to undersize it, to react too slowly. I think if you look back at 2007, 2008, um, as, as a, you know, a precedent today, even though the nature of the crisis is very different, during that crisis, as it began to metastasize, there was a belief that it could be contained. The responses initially were too uh, modest. Uh, and only over time did they grow to meet the challenge. But even uh, in the wake of the 2008 crisis, we should be very clear, we did learn that absence a very strong fiscal and monetary response from the federal government, we would have gone into a depression. But the fact is, if you look back at 2008, we did not do enough. The stimulus, uh, which came in at below a trillion dollars, was not sufficient, and it was not sufficient because, frankly, it was blocked uh, by Republicans, the very Tea Party folks that uh, Nick mentioned. And, and as a result, we dealt with the immediate crisis. We stabilized the financial institutions, but we did not do nearly enough to uh, stabilize and revitalize the broader economy. We didn't do enough for homeowners. We didn't do enough for working people. And the result was a very slow extended recovery that was very uneven in its results, which I think has contributed also to a lot of the political instability and deep divides in this country that persist today. So I think looking, I want to endorse what Nick said, the magnitude of this crisis is enormous and we cannot undersize the response. The second thing that I wanted to say is really a reiteration of something that we should know by now, but I'm not really sure that it's fully embedded in public policy or in the actions of our society. Let's be blunt about this. The United States uh, did, did a terrible job in response to this crisis. It's just a fact. If you look at it, not in term, only in terms of the objective results in terms of fatalities and economic impact, but in comparison to other economies and societies around the world. Germany took much stronger, faster, faster action to test, to trace, and then to segregate folks with infections. South Korea did the same. Uh, Germany, for example, immediately moved to do payroll support. So the, while the Euro economy is probably looking at unemployment as a whole, going around 9 or 10%. In Germany, the predictions are it will go to 5.6, perhaps 6%. Uh, here in the United States, we're going to see unemployment of 20% because we did not do enough quickly enough to enable people to keep people on their payroll uh, in this country. I think it's important as we go forward to remember this. There will be no economic stability or recovery without a resolution to the public health crisis. So moving ahead, I still think we have a challenge in that we do not have a strong, coordinated federal government response to what is a national and global problem, not a state by state problem. And until we do the following, at least pre-vaccine, dramatically uh, increase testing, dramatically increase tracing, segregate people who are in fact contagious, we're gonna have, I think John referred to it as a W, I think we're gonna have a very long and difficult time. And so we cannot, as we, you know, this talk about reopening the economy, there is no reopening the economy without a strong coordinated public policy response on the health front. Um, I should add that uh, one of the things, John, you mentioned early is, I don't think we also can undersize, given the contours of uh, income and wealth in this country, the disparate effect that this is going to have. Remember, it was only back in 2018 that the Federal Reserve came out with a study that said 40% of Americans could only endure a $400 uh, shock, unexpected expense. And so we have significant numbers of people in our society who will be unemployed, underemployed, small businesses, and the road to recovery will be long and hard for those folks. 
one, one other thing I want to put on the table. One of the items that must be dealt with that was not dealt with in the wake of the 2008 crisis that hobbled our recovery is, you know, we are a federal government. We are composed of 50 states, essentially, and the District of Columbia and our territories. And the fact is that unlike the federal government, all those states have balanced budget requirements. They are all going to see enormous impacts to their revenues as well as their costs. They're only two solutions on their own because they have limited ability to borrow in the same kind of context as the federal government. The only two solutions will be to raise taxes, which is not a good thing to do in a recessionary, depressionary environment, or to dramatically cut costs, both of which feed the economic downturn. One of the reasons we had such a low recovery, uh, slow recovery post-2008 is we had essentially 50 anti-stimulus machines operating at full speed all around the country. So take my state of California. We entered this crisis with a uh, supposedly a robust rainy day fund of $20 billion. Well, that's against a general fund budget of $144 billion. It will be exhausted very quickly. The state's revenues are essentially income tax. The real effect on that will be felt next year, not this year, because of capital gains from 2019. The other major source is sales tax. All across this country, doesn't matter whether they're red states or blue states, States and localities will be facing a desperate situation, will be required to cut services and or raise revenues, all of which will dampen economic recovery. And it is in our national interest, apropos of what Nick was talking about, to ensure that we can have stability in local and state uh, finances so that we don't, in a sense, accelerate and deepen the recession and elongate the recovery time. Um, I think that's what I had to say. I mean, a lot of what was said before, but those are kind of my thoughts um, as we stand here today. If I may follow up on just one of those points uh, about the uh, gap between the richest and the poorest Americans. In 2008, some thought the inadequacy of the response was one contributor to that widening gap. In this case, it's the virus itself which is exacerbating the gap because it's having a greater health impact on those of lesser means. Are, is it time for a modern New Deal? And, and should much of that $4 trillion that's being spent be directed in that kind of a direction? And is there a political will for that kind of thing? Well, two things. If you look at the recoveries from uh, recessions over time, if you look at uh, uh, the recovery from the recession in the early 80s, then look at the recession in the early 90s. You look at what happened in the dot-com collapse and, and that recovery, and then 2008. In each and every instance, the recoveries have been more and more uneven, with less of the recovery going to wage growth and more of it going to co corporate profits and folks at the top. Um, and so I do think you need a concerted government policy to ensure that the recovery is one that is broad-based. And again, we did not do enough in 2008. I mean, the fact is we rightly stabilized the financial sector. And then what we did is we let millions and millions of people lose their homes, uh, essentially froze and paralyzed the real estate market. We're gonna have the same kind of dislocations here. Don't think for a minute that retail is gonna come back as robustly as it existed pre-COVID for a variety of factors. I think there's, for example, I think the office sector and real estate will be under pressure. So I do think we have an obligation to do two things. First of all, staunch the bleeding with very significant stimulus now, but let's not make the mistake we made in 2008. And the minute that the kind of the evident crisis is over, stop doing what we need to do to fuel the recovery. And so I do think, yes, a new New Deal in which we make long-term investments. Now, you know, engaging in capital projects now, those are not things that can come online in two or four weeks. But there's a second stage here where I do think the second stage of stimulus has to be structural, has to be more long-term oriented to fuel and guide the recovery going forward. 
Well, thank you, Phil. Uh, as we come close to wrapping up, I'd like to invite uh, Art and, and Drake uh, back on camera. And I'd like to throw it to the four panelists uh, to see if anybody has concluding remarks that you'd like to leave us with. So Doretta, let's start with you. No, I nothing else to add. I think this was, um, I, I certainly learned a lot just being on the panel. So thank you, Drake and Art for this great idea and looking forward to next week. Thank you, Doretta. Nick. I, again, I too would just like to add my thanks to you and Art and to Drake and you know the whole organization for pulling this together. It's been a lot of fun. Same here, the best to all of us. And the one thing I would say is I just hope we learn the lessons of this crisis. We could have handled it better. And, and the fact is that we need to learn from the consequences of our mistakes. And it's my hope as a society, we look hard at ourselves that we once again prize confidence in the public sector, something we've diminished over the last decades, and that we think about what are the investments we need to make as a whole, to make all of us stronger, because I think this crisis has shown that we are all in this together. Thank you very much to NHS, uh, to Art and Drake and everyone, and to my fellow panelists from whom I learned a lot. Well, thank you, Phil and uh, Nick and Doretta. It's always great to see you, and it was uh, wonderful hearing your wisdom today. Uh, we're all richer because of it. Thank you, and uh, stay safe, everybody. I also want to thank uh, Drake and Art and Maria and Stephanie for putting this on, and uh, Art, if I Thank, Thank you very John. much. Thanks to the panelists. And uh, what's great is that uh, there's Greek Americans doing some wonderful things out there. We're very proud of all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Next Art. week, next week's uh, edition will be on real estate. Uh, Phil, maybe we'll have you back on. <laughs> <laughs> there are brighter minds than me. Good George and Marcus on. He'll tell us what. He'll, he'll, he'll you all. Me. all right. Good deal, guys. Thanks Bye -bye. to everybody watching and, and listening. Thank you very much. Take care. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.